My name's Hilda Morrison. Um, I retired from the Royal two years ago. I came to the Royal in 1979 as a student nurse, having been formally trained at the Vale of Leven as an enrolled nurse and worked there for a year. And then I came to Glasgow Royal Infirmary and I remember walking up um, the high street, looking at the medical building and thinking, oh, that's a big hospital. And then getting the side view of the full panorama and thinking, oh Lord, what have I done? But here I am. And I did my training because I was previously trained. I got six months off for good behavior. And in 1981, October the 26th, I can remember that, I went to work in accident and emergency for six months experience. And after a year, I decided I would do my accident emergency certificate, which half of it was done here at the Royal and half was done at the Southern General because we got experience there in neuro ITU. So at the end of my course, I came back to a &E here and it was the old department described by William McIlvenny as being both functional and ornate, like a Victorian Nissen hut, which was probably a very apt description of it. Um, we had five cubicles down the middle. There was two and then there was a waiting area and then there was another three and they were labelled A to E. And it was well known that if somebody was going to go downstairs to the delousing room, they were wheeled straight to cubicle E. In fact, we had a regular patient who, when he came in pulling his shopping trolley, didn't bother stopping. He just went straight to cubicle E because he knew if he was going to spend time with us, that was where he was spending it. So, in 90, there was lots of plans to upgrade the department. In fact, Miss Burney, our old nursing officer, used to talk about them having been around since 1957, which was when I was born. So, from November 1989, it was decided that our upgrading would go ahead. And we took over what essentially was the a &E ward and the fracture clinic. They had upgraded those and already, and they'd turned it all into a new fracture clinic. And we were to move across first so that um, they could then upgrade our end of the department. And we moved in November 1989, and we moved back in the June of 1992, our new and upgraded department. And essentially what they'd done was changed the five cubicles in the middle to six cubicles, painted them battleship grey and faced them the opposite direction. They gave us a small cubicle within the department in which to do triage and they moved reception to where the waiting hall had been. And that was it. They painted everything battleship grey and they said, haven't you got a lovely new department? And we were like, yes, it's beautiful. But we had a completely blank corridor because we then couldn't see the resource room because the way they'd positioned the cubicles, it was completely blank and we couldn't see anything down that corridor. So they then had to put a mirror in. So if you were standing at the triage desk, every so often you had to do that. So you could look down the corridor and see if there were any patients there and if they were well. The department, the new department that we have now, we moved into during the millennium. It was not long after the new millennium came and then we moved up. And that in itself, there was months of preparation of looking at the department, would this work, would that work? No, we wanted that there. What equipment did we need? And as usual, the equipment budget got cut, all these sorts of things. But you know, in the grand scheme of things, none of those things really mattered. We got our brand new department, but our characters came with us, both staff-wise and patient-wise. I remember during the upgrading of the old department, um, when we moved to the fracture clinic, I walked across to, they had built us a tunnel, a polytunnel across the car park, so we didn't get wet if we were out in the rain 
to get to the dining room. And as I approached it one night, there was a wee drunk man sitting in the waiting hall, and he said, Do you know something, sister? See your new department? Looking round the waiting hall of what was essentially the Pratchett Clinic. It's got no ambience, so it has no. Which, I was trying to keep my face straight while I addressed this gentleman, but the people round about me were falling apart. And that was the character of many of the people we met. They loved our department. It was part of their family, almost. There was one lady was asked who her GP was, and she said, I don't have a GP. Now, this lady was in her 70s, and she said, I've always just come to the Royal. My mammy used to bring me, and her mammy brought her. And nobody in this lady's family of her generation had a GP because they always came to the Royal. And I think that's something about the Royal. To a lot, to people who lived within the catchment area, it was a place of safety. It was somewhere they turned for help. And sometimes they came up just to see how we were. We had a wee lady that used to come up every morning just to say hello and see the younger people because the old gens round about her were Dane or Heedon, quote. And so in the old department, we had room nine, which was our resuscitation room. And we had theatre. We did theatre lists. Our consultants were Mr Swan, who dealt mainly with the trauma that came in and emergencies um, like that and advising the younger doctors. And we had Mr Simpson, who, while he did those functions, was essentially a hand surgeon. And we learned a lot in our theatre. Our theatre was only socially clean. We put gowns on over our uniforms to set up. And we didn't gown as nurses within the theatre, but we had the lowest infection rate in the hospital because once it had Granny's tea towel wrapped round it, who could introduce anything worse to it? I remember being sent to Edinburgh to a conference and I was walking across North Bridge thinking that I looked very swish in my suit and carrying my little overnight bag. And coming towards me was the wee man that always went straight to cubicle E and I was thinking, he won't recognise me out of uniform. And as he passed, he said, you all right, sister, lovely day. And I thought, oh, okay, hello. <laughs> so people knew the staff. They identified them in the street. We had a lot of highs. We had some lows, but you tended to lose those in the memories. There were some memorable ones, but you tended to lose those in the memories because of the character of the people that you were seeing. And I know that one of my colleagues spoke earlier about the levels of violence. And in the days when people could drink at football matches and there was some real trouble, especially old firm games, it could get a bit hairy of a night. Um, there was one night, the riot police, I think, had to go down to Duke Street, um, complete with the horse people and the horse police. And actually, there was one policeman, his horse reared and went over backwards, and he was underneath the horse. And while he could walk, he was a bit bruised and a bit battered when we got him. But everyone that went in to see him said, how's the horse? The horse apparently was fine. He was in his stable back where he should have been. Um, there was an incident after one old firm game where I had to present myself to Mr Swan the next morning and say, we really need to do something about the level of violence. There was a man who took a swing at Sister last night and he said, well, you need to teach Sister to duck. I said, Sister did duck, but your junior doctor's now in Cannesburn having his two front teeth transplanted. Um, I think the new department, the staff have always been like a family. And my six months in accident and emergency extended into 37 years. I, got, I was in the department five years before I got my sister's post. Um, and a lot of senior nurses were very good at helping you develop within your role, which was good. 
Uh, a lot of the patients also helped you develop within your role, but perhaps not so good. Younger nurses nowadays, I'm not sure they have the fun that we had. We had a lot of fun. We had a lot of companionship. Um, a lot of us met our life partners, husbands, whomever, in the department. I certainly met my husband in the department. He was with the ambulance service. And our lives revolved around the department very much. Our children came in. I remember a wee drunk man one day giving my daughter possibly his only treasured possession, which turned out to be a key ring of a Hollywood film star. Um, and he gave it to her, and she was about three, and she said, thank you very much. And she put it in her pocket. And I remember at the time thinking, that's lovely. It's probably the only thing this gentleman has. I think he lived in um, 100 Duke Street, which in those days was a model lodging house. And, I, and she was thrilled with it. And I remember thinking, as soon as I get home, I must just give it a wee wash. And then, and she still has it. She's 25 now, and she still has her key ring that the man gave her. And it was probably, as I say, the only thing the man possessed. But that's the generous spirit of the Glasgow people. And I think possibly that's what makes life in A&E, because you not only see tragedy, there's a lot of comedy down there. Some of it is very unwitting comedy. That's amongst the staff as well as the patients. The staff are like a family. They're very protective of one another. And they are very... They're happy people, even when they're not, when they're unhappy, they come across, they have a persona that comes across as all is good. Sometimes all is not good. And we recognize that and we get through it by supporting one another. And I, as I say, retired in September 2018. And all I could say in my retirement speech was I had a ball. I had a wonderful time and I wouldn't change a single minute of it for anything. Thank you for listening to an old lady warble on. Thank you. <laughs>